Okay, so this presentation will be a bit different because of the subject I choose. It's a bit different from the, the other one because I will not talk about taxonomic checklist, but other kind of checklist that you may be aware I used in the world. So what are, we'll, what are we talking about? So the checklist that we've seen today in, uh, in most of your uh, daily work, uh, you're used to taxonomic checklist, but the, these taxons, they are also used by uh, in other parts of the world, I mean, for example, in legal text. And it's very important uh, part because it, uh, it's important for nature protection or uh, environmental regulation and these kind of things. And uh, I, in, in the recent months, I had a look at some of them and I would like to share my experience on that. The, the thing is that when you see this list, it's really not very well formatted compared to what we've seen just before. Because uh, is it fair? It's not fair at all. Uh, it's findable if you, if you take a bit of time. It's uh, accessible, but mostly in PDF format. And it's not inter interoperable and it's not uh, uh, reusable. Uh, and uh, another problem is that this list and the legal text linked to the list, they both evolved in time. So the versioning of these things is incredibly hard to follow. And uh, the fact that this is uh, in, the, in this uh, situation, it's really an impediment to the regulations and uh, the follow-up uh, actions uh, on, on these regulations. I took three uh, examples uh, from uh, Europe, uh, very well-known uh, uh, examples. Uh, first one is the BERT directives. Second one is the habitat directive. And the third one is the burn conventions. I tried to find these uh, in a readable format for human. It's more or less easy to, to find that. But for a machine, try to find a, a good uh, JSON or CSV uh, version of that. It's really horrible. And it's no way that you can find uh, the, the, the correct version or the latest version or anything like that uh, on the web. And there are many others. The, these are three examples, but there are many other things where the taxon appears in the local legislation or national or regional or global. And it's really a, ni a nightmare. So first of all, there are only scientific names. If you are lucky, you have scientific name. No author, no things that are like uh, publication or taxon comes set behind that. So you just have just a scientific name. <clears throat> Sometimes you have uh, even common names. And uh, this legislation not always apply to a uh, species or to a subspecies. But sometimes you see things like castor fiber, except these and these and these and these populations, which makes the thing a bit more difficult to see if, if, uh, if uh, it's, so it's less than a species, of course. And uh, these legislation are quite complicated. You have remarks, exception, footnotes, and uh, all these stars or double stars and all these things like that, which make it horrible to, to find. And then uh, you have example like this, the Microheroptera, ex all species except one, the Pipistrellus uh, pipistrellus. So what does it mean? What are the species covered by this legislation? It's really hard, and it's not just a single taxon. It's not the genus. It's the genus minus one species. How can you express that in a machine actionable thing? You also have outdated uh, taxa, of course, like reptiles. You have synonyms, uh, typos, and uh, all these kind of things in, in, the, in the legal text. So what I did, I tried to, to publish uh, that as... Uh, in a, in a good manner, I try to find first the standard that I should use. I investigate with Darwin Core that I know uh, very well from my experience. And I also try with the Catalog of Life DP. 
What is possible to put uh, in these standards? What is not possible? Uh, where should I publish that to GBIF? Should I publish that to Checklist Bank, to both or elsewhere? That was kind of question I had in mind. Uh, I also use uh, frictionless data as a uh, format standard that some of you may have used, uh, which is very flexible. I, I, it's part of the exercise I made. So my approach was to extract all the things that I could extract from the PDF, which are relevant to this, to this list of species, and create a kind of CSV when it, uh, when it was not available online. Then uh, map that to Darwin Core concept or to catalog of live DP, and to put that together with uh, having all the additional or original data in a, in a folder. The main question I had was, where do I publish that? Because if I try to find them, I don't find them. So there is not a single repository for that. So where should I publish this list? Is Checklist Bank the best uh, place? <clears throat> How do I refer to the text? Because the, this list without having the text is uh, are meaningless. So where should I put the text? Or should I republish the text somewhere? Or is there a DOI for this legal text? Not, not always. Uh, and who? Why should I? myself published this text. Isn't it the, the, the legal uh, body that uh, give the, the text that should publish uh, it somewhere? I think it's the, the, the originator of the legal text that should publish these, this list. Can I find examples of, of these things somewhere? And are there best practice somewhere? So, if, as a citizen, the user experience uh, should be very different. It should be very easy to, to find all the legal texts for a specific species. There should be a repository somewhere. And uh, at the moment, I haven't seen anything like that. The data should be com comprehensible. The granularity should be easy to understand. The, the geographic uh, or time applicability of these texts should be easy to find. Uh, and this not only for a human, but also for a machine. Or, and it's not the case. However, there are some uh, very good uh, examples of things in specific area. For example, the, the CITES and uh, the, the CMS, uh, the Convention on uh, Migratory Species, and uh, some uh, European trading uh, list are visible <clears throat> and accessible uh, on uh, this uh, Species Plus website. There are some web services where you can get it uh, with uh, all the information uh, you want to find, but this is only for this list. There are many others uh, everywhere. Another example is for the invasive species. There is also a website with different information, with different uh, formatting, but you can get uh, JSON uh, data out of, of this through the web service. So it's very good, but it's different from the other one. So <clears throat> my message is that I would like to have these, all these legal checklists be, being fair and following the fair principle, but I don't know how to, <laughs> how to initiate this. Is it something that we should add to the GBIF data model? Uh, is it uh, how to make sure that any new uh, legislation come with a fair uh, checklist somewhere that it can be easily retrieved? Is, should we need, do we need a, a global repository that, as we have for the taxonomic uh, list, maybe yes. And it's a, it's a large effort. It's, it goes far beyond this uh, Tedwick uh, JBIF uh, community, I think. We need to talk with the policymakers, with the lawyers, and all this 
kind of thing. So it goes way beyond from our uh, community. Maybe the CBD with this uh, global knowledge support services for biodiversity is the, 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 the people who are trying to build this kind of thing. But we have to do something. The citizen is, for the moment, is completely lost in, in these kind of things. So I would like to uh, acknowledge some people from the GBIF nodes uh, in Poland and in, uh, in uh, Portugal and in Belgium for talking with me on this subject. And hopefully one day the legal text will be comprehensible for everybody, every people and all the machines also. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Andre. And are there any questions? Thank you very much for bringing this very important topic. For any system, national, international, thematic, or, or whatever, being able to filter by a list of policy relevance is a huge opportunity and uh, to to be known, to be funded, be, uh, be relevant beyond the immediate circle of database and biologists. Um, what, what I think will happen here, you can compare the issue, the problem, which you identified very well, with uh, building a national list of names. Mm -hmm. I did this job when I was working in Finnish Node of GBIF, and um, it's, um, you often uh, deal with, with, with people with attitudes who are not very well familiar with what we do here. And instead of enforcing any kind of templates or the ways which will be alien to them, you go around with a memory stick then and just take whatever format they provide and do all the work with your own hands. And there are examples of the buffer organizations which actually capture whatever data is available and format them in the palatable form. There is Global Registry of Invasive and Introduced Species, Greece, which handles and generates the policy relevant checklist for invasives. Not every country has a national red list, but some do. And then there is IUCN, which produces a list. So I think the principle is that we should have buffer organizations between Checklist Bank and Catalog of Life and the, and the originators of the species, of pol or species list of policy relevance. They can be legal or not legal. Some of them have informal status, but that's the only invasive uh, list of species the country has. So whatever beautiful is the solution we can build here, I think it will never be picked by the originators of this list. There must be a buffer layer to convert. And this layer should be funded. So uh, how exactly this is done, uh, I don't know. But I think there should be a layer in between. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, thank, th thanks very much, and definitely need that buffer layer, and I'll assume we've got that paid for. Um, in the meantime, um, I, I look, looking at your examples, like microcoroptera, except for Pipistrellus pipistrellus, and castor fiber, except in these regions, um, you know, it's easy for us to start thinking about how we might define this as a, much like we do our standard lists. In other words, by, by um, example, pretty much, it, it's a list of things uh, but actually, they look an awful lot more like filters um, and, and sort of sets of things which are then associated with an attribute, like protection status. So maybe, it, maybe we could get some benefit about exploring how we might represent these as sets that we can then apply on our other taxonomic lists that are actually filters that then serve as masks, to attach the information. I, I look, looking at it, I could imagine doing it in pandas or something much more easily than I could by articulating the list itself. That's not a question, sorry. <laughs> Couldn't we? Uh, yeah, sorry, <clears throat> Andre. Um, uh, I also don't have a question. Just wanted to say that <clears throat> this topic is uh, to me, uh, really important. And um, um, as Catalog of Life, we are actually in continuous conversation with the European Environmental Agency. They are starting to realize that it might be their job to get the initial list published. <laughs> um, uh, they have published uh, 
yeah, quite some list, uh, over 30 lists already in Checklist Bank. But apparently, and that strikes me, is that, you know, that um, the organizations we deal with uh, apparently still need to be convinced that it needs to be open somewhere. And, uh, and that groundwork, uh, at least uh, from Catalog of Life, we're willing to do for a certain part. And definitely Checklist Bank, I think, could be used for policy-relevant list. Uh, we need to do a slightly better job at, um, I say, making them available. But I think that that's, that's the reality, that we deal with a group of partners that uh, don't really realize that this might be one of their responsibilities to make it at least available somewhere. Um, I'm thinking of something else. Um, when I've been searching for various names, I sometimes come across names in these documents which simply do not exist. They're illegal, illegitimate names. Um, they don't refer to any organism that is on the planet. So um, I kind of think maybe searching through these documents, finding these examples, and then approaching these government organizations and saying, this is a legal document that refers to nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and actually just rubbing the, the nose and rub the puppy's nose in its thing and, and hope it learns. May I follow up? I mean, on Henry's point at a different level, I'm curious between the vision that Dimitri has just shared and others have added to, does this mean we have an opportunity in these things like MOUs to think about the ecologists who come back and say, I went out and did this study and this work. I published this list for this government or this entity. And now someone comes along and does a synonymization of a bunch of things or splits a bunch of things. And now the names have, you know, are different. So the circumscription, are we looking at allopatry or sympatry and do we protect this or both or only one? Do these opportunities you're describing at the policy level give us a user interface level to help uh, somebody write policy that takes these changes into effect? It won't be easy, but this notion of writing the legalese so we can understand it, it's fabulous. But I'm, I'm just trying to imagine a world in which we can accept that that statement of listed species is going to be in flux. It's not a static thing. So is this an opportunity to address that? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I would like to comment on the that nobody does something on the legal side. I mean, uh, at least we have a EU directive called INSPIRE that is actually telling everybody, every government that is reporting on uh, European uh, environmental and uh, species, somehow species related things, that they have to uh, use uh, the standard uh, European list. So this is kind of a way to do that. Uh, the question is how good are these lists and uh, are people actually complying or is somebody controlling it? But at least on that level, something can be done and that forces governments at least to do something about it because it's legally binding. Oh, uh, you have any adv advice on in how to approach policymakers to convince, encourage them to publish their lists? I have no no advice, and I would probably do the same as I, I did for the the biodiversity data, the current one. But okay, we have several more. I see one uh, okay. in the back. Hi, <laughs> I'm Andrew from Atlas Living Australia. Um, I feel like I'm going against the trend, but I just wanted to let people know there's a state in Australia, Western Australia. They've got the Western Australia Organism List which is an online database that's linked to their legislation. You can access it by API and you can pull out things like lists of um, their prohibited species as well as some of the species that are actually found in there. I don't think it's comprehensive, but it's a fantastic step in the right direction and it's maintained by the Western Australia government. So we can just access it. I see yes. the... You, no. and you're going to get the... 
Oh, okay. I just wanted to follow on from Deb and put my little foot in um, and say that all of these names need to be linked to vouchers so that when we do have taxonomic changes, and so that means our collections need support, please. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, Walter and the gentleman. Yeah, um, uh, I would like to agree with what Olaf said that it would always oh, oh, already be a, a big step forward if we get this uh, list, list public. But in addition to what uh, what Henry was saying, uh, I wonder if actually sharing a, a list of names um, are specific enough for 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 legislation. Um, maybe it would be better to 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 have a list of reference uh, specimens that have uh, good identifications which are much more more specific uh, to use i think um cameron sletcher from the atlas of living australia um we're we're in the process of actually working with uh, state agencies in australia to develop a an agreed list of, of uh sensitive species so species that are getting generalizations applied to them um I think there's there's a couple of learnings in that process which are probably useful to this discussion. And I think the first thing you need to understand is that the reason that most of these statutory lists exist is not to service our community or science or anything else. There's statements about which species actually have to be protected legislatively. They are entirely legislative, legislative document. And the, the, the impetus to actually convert them into a uh, machine readable form simply doesn't exist in government. It just simply does not exist. So the, the conversation that we've had with, with agencies, most, most agencies are very willing to be part of that conversation. They're also very willing for the, the Atlas of Living Australia to do all the driving because it's, it's outside their use case. Um, so in answer to the question on the screen, I think, uh, at an international scale, you can approach IUCN or the or the the state parties involved with the, the Convention of Biological Diversity. They'll be interested in the discussion. They'll be interested in increasing the public accessibility of the list, but it's outside what their actual roles are. And I think we all need to be clear on that. So I, I think that the idea of, of having a... a, a, a a, a, an, an in-between thing that, that's making that information available is, is probably the only ever way that this is ever going to work. Um, and the other thing I'd note is you can't attach these things to specimens, unfortunately, uh, because the, the, the way policy makers define species is not the way scientists define species. Um, and uh, the... And, while my excellent colleague up the other end loves the Western Australian Organism Register, I hate it because most of the things on it don't actually exist. Um, <laughs> but it is a step in the right direction, I'll agree, Andrew. Um, anyway, sorry, I'll stop there, otherwise I'll keep reading. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, one last question towards this end because we have some comments on the uh, things before and I promise to... Uh, address those. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Alan Stenhouse from CSIRO here. Um, I was just going to say, going back sort of one step and maybe follows on from Cam, um, that the use of AI, LLM, large language models are going to be extremely useful for processing legal documents and extracting, hopefully, that information out. Now the intermediate organisations or processes may be able to provide that and also the matching to species if it's required or whatever. So just a thought, if you haven't used that before. Thank you. I, I would like to come back to Quentin and his name, uh, person. Uh, yeah, just to remind people, I was moaning at the, uh, that checklists just leave people as strings or even... Um, well, so the point is, people are really easy to deal with, particularly on vascular plants. So one thing about people is that uh, when you're connecting them, it all follows a power law. So if you look at specimens, if you uh, disambiguate about 3% of the people on specimens, it turns out you actually disambiguate about 80% of specimens, only leaving 20% of specimens still to do. And it's going to be the same with names as well. It's going to follow a power law. So 
it's actually one of the easiest things to do. And then we do have identifiers for all vascular plants. We have an IPI identifier for all the people. That's in Wikidata, which links it all to the biographies of those people, which means you can cross-reference it to the dates of publication and with the people. So if you have parent and, and uh, child teams, and those are the, often the ones that get confused, you can easily check the dates to make sure they match properly. Um, it really is such a low-hanging fruit that that's what kind of frustrates me, that they're still just using strings for people um, when they're putting so much effort into the most complicated thing, um, they could put it into the easy thing and cross-validate the more complicated thing, which is the Latin names. I just want to, it's Siobhan Leachman from Wikimedia Aotearoa New Zealand, and I um, absolutely agree with Quentin. I've just been on um, the Australian species list and had a look, and they've actually got an identifier for people in there. Um, I know in Wikidata their identifier for plants is already in um, to get their people identifier linked up to the authors, which are looking at it would be relatively simple. It's just creating a property and then running an algorithm over it and actually getting it matched. A lot of them would match because they've already got their um, uh, abbreviations attached to that identifier. It would, should be relatively simple. So I'm just saying it. it I'm 100% agreeing with Quentin that it's easy, low-hanging fruit. Uh, two more comments, and then we have to give room to uh, coffee. Uh, so I'm starting here, and I see one more over there. Yeah, and Niels Klaasra from the Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria. Uh, there's actually no direct link to uh, people in the domain. It should all go to the publication. Uh, the author string is not an is not an agent. It's really just a string. There was somebody somebody over there, I saw. Yep. Sorry, it was only me going to be facetious. If you'd like to provide some resourcing to help us, we'd be more than happy to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was asking for volunteers as well. But, <laughs> but okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed by this... Uh, uh, amount of people attending this uh, thing. I thought we were the Gretel room and with 20 people maximum attending. And so it shows that we're really making progress on these questions and the services out there are really uh, give me a lot of hope. I mean, I've been fighting for these things for a long time and I think it's coming really to uh, some useful uh, solutions now. Thank you very much. Just while you're getting up, can I just uh, give you one little commercial, uh, which is to remind you and anyone who's not looking at Slack that there is a tribute session